renewable energy production is low cost. The production's pretty cheap compared to fossil fuels these days. The problem with wind and solar, for example, is the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. And therefore, we need to have some way to store that energy such that we can use the energy stored to precisely meet the supply and demand at any given time. So let's talk about pump storage um, for a moment. On windy days, surplus power could be used to pump water from low to high altitude reservoirs. This water could in turn be released to generate power on days when demand is high and wind levels are low. This cycle can be repeated over and over again. It scales very well. It allows long-term storage. It's the lowest cost solution that's currently available on the market. And there still are opportunities to either expand existing pump storage plants repower existing pump storage with new technologies or potentially develop some new you know, pump storage plants. The market has turned towards battery storage. Battery is an old technology. Sitting among rustic scenes on a wind farm north of Adelaide, the Hornsdale Power Reserve or Tesla Big Battery has been mocked by critics since day one. The naysayers said it was a waste of money, but this big battery is already playing a key role in stabilising the grid and it's doing so with a speed, precision and agility that's never been seen before. Our whole grid is set up such that at any given time, the supply to the grid precisely meets demand. Conventional generators can't match the way the battery makes small adjustments to power supply to keep the grid at the right frequency. This is the market operator's instruction. This is the response of a conventional power station. The battery is far swifter and more accurate. Utilities are just starting to see the point where they do a side-by-side -side comparison of a life cycle cost competitor battery and like, hey, that pencils out. You know, that's, that's at or slightly below the life cycle cost of a combustion turbine. The battery storage technology looks to us like the solar industry maybe four, five, six years ago. And if it does follow that same trajectory, um, we could be into uh, grid-sized storage in a fairly big way uh, by the middle of the 2020s, certainly the end of the 2020s. In Arizona these days, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., we get uh, negatively priced electricity from California. There's so much solar being produced in California, they can't use it all. They push it to, to Arizona during those hours and pay our utilities to take it off the grid. So when California exports to Arizona an excess of PV, maybe Arizonans can have their electric vehicles intelligently charged to absorb that at a very low cost. We've been looking at these vehicles as not only charging from the grid, but also providing power back to the grid during periods of emergencies or during uh, regular operation to maintain the reliability of the power system. There is a very large effort uh, here and also, of course, in, in many states about uh, uh, using the buildings themselves for, for storage. Buildings have uh, thermal energy, so you can uh, think of them as thermal reservoirs by turning on and off uh, air conditioners and uh, adjusting the load this way. So this is like distributed controllable loads rather than uh, distributed energy source. We've just got way too much wind during the spring. Is there any way we could store that, that wind in the spring and shift that to the summer? And that's when you get into things like synthetic fuel production, hydrogen, methane, or other liquid or gas fuels. Using solar energy for electrolysis, uh, generating hydrogen, and storing hydrogen either in uh, uh, natural gas depleted caverns or actually uh, storing them with natural gas uh, so you can use it at home for your furnace and so this way you can make instantly uh, 5 to 10 percent uh, natural gas, renewable natural gas. So the concern has been that the grid will be unstable, you'll have high cost to keep it stable if we go to large-scale wind, water, and solar power. When I started in this business just 15 years ago, we used to talk about 10 to 20 percent being kind of the, the, the wall. You know, the, it, it, you know, people used to talk about, oh, it gets really hard at 20 percent, and you just can't do it beyond 20 percent. 37 percent of our electricity production is done by renewables. The vast majority is done by wind and photovoltaics. And I can tell you what, the grid is extremely stable. 
We have grid uh, um, disruption a year at about 12 minutes. So 12 minutes a year is effectively nothing. Well, actually, nobody really talks about a, a hard number anymore. Um, again, 80% is a, is a very notional number. I mean, people might claim it might be 90. Other might, people might say, say it's 60 or 70. But that's kind of the, the mental model that we use at this point um, as to where we think that the real, real challenges or challenges that we don't really understand really start to kick in.